Raven Rock, uh, which is both about Raven Rock, the place, and about the uh, apparatus that that place stands for within, within the federal government. Um, it's just really a, a terrific read um, that I, I really enjoyed. If you haven't yet read it, um, we do have copies for sale, which I will uh, remind you at, uh, at the end of our discussion as well. Uh, and uh, so this is Garrett's uh, third book. He's uh, previously written a book about the FBI, which is uh, an institution that's in the news a little bit these days, uh, and edited uh, Washingtonian Magazine, First Track, as well as Politico Magazine, uh, and now lives in Vermont and, and writes. Um, so thank you, Garrett, uh, for coming. Um, we thought we'd just kick it off directly with uh, the level, right? With a, with a test of sound levels. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Um, and uh, just directly, just just get Garrett to uh, to talk a little bit uh, about the book rather than than reading from it. So uh, we'll chat for a bit and then sort of open it up to to the room. Um, so the book goes back essentially, and you have bits that you go back further in history, but essentially to the, from the start of the Cold War up until the present day. Um, and I want to sort of hop back and forth over that history a bit. But what struck me, and, and this is sort of like implicit in, in the subtitle of the book, uh, which is, uh, I, I think, terrifically provocative, the story of the US government's secret plan to save itself while the rest of us die. Um, and uh, what was surprising to me, knowing some of this history, was sort of how explicit that turn was from the sort of early days of the Cold War and sort of civil defense efforts, where there really was, uh, whether it would have worked or not is another question, but the bureaucracy was focused on trying to protect the populace at large and not just on sort of the national command authority. Uh, and that changed over time. And, and you tell the story of that change in the book, and I just sort of wanted to hear you talk about that yeah. transition a bit. So uh, thanks so much uh, for having me tonight. Uh, I uh, always have a special affinity for New America, so it's great to be back uh, here. Um, it, yeah, as, as you mentioned, my last book was uh, a history of the FBI and the only biography in existence of Robert Mueller. Uh, and so last Wednesday at this time, uh, I had thought I had written my last thing about Robert Mueller uh, in my life and uh, now uh, have spent the last week diving back into the last book, uh, even as I am out talking about this one. Um, so uh, as, as you say, the. Uh, this is the story of an evolving technology revolution. Um, and what, what has always interested me as a writer is the way that technology changes institutions. Um, and sort of all of my books have been about that uh, at, in, in different ways. My first book was about the 2008 presidential race and the role that technology was changing uh, and shaping uh, politics going forward. And then my FBI history was really the story of how technology and globalization had reshaped the FBI. And this book is effectively the story of one very specific technology and the way that it has reshaped one very specific institution. Um, that being how nuclear weapons have changed the presidency. And this is a story that takes place over the arc of the Cold War, uh, you know, really beginning with Truman and Eisenhower and then petering off in towards the end of the Reagan years and the beginning of the Bush 41 years, uh, but then sort of comes back to the fore, uh, obviously, on 9-11 and then uh, has been reincarnated for, uh, for modern times in terms of uh, you know, threats to the electrical grid and cyber threats and, uh, and, and public health pandemics and sort of all of these weird things that we struggle with today. Uh, and then in the spring of uh, 2017, uh, back to nuclear war and Russia and North Korea in a way that we have uh, not had as present a threat um, for such a long period of time. But it, as you say, these plans start out in the Truman and Eisenhower years as these very grand, ambitious hopes. And they, you sort of see them unfold through several very distinct and different chapters of the Cold War, where you begin with 
the idea of uh, sort of Soviet bombers coming to the United States, where you would have eight to ten to twelve hours of warning, uh, and and even in that era, sort of the possibility that you could evacuate whole cities, or at least make a real stab at uh, evacuating whole cities. And then uh, the technology advances, and you begin to shift tor first towards ICBMs, and then uh, submarine-launched uh, missiles, which obviously shrink that warning time down to 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, and then the weapons get stronger and larger, as you see the shift from atomic uh, weapons to thermonuclear weapons. And then, as we all know now, the arms race sort of gets just completely out of control, and you end up with 30,000 uh, know, nuclear and thermonuclear weapons and delivered in under an hour to every corner of the globe, and effectively there's very little hope left. Uh, except for these plans sort of continuing to shrink and simplify down to the uh, evacuation of a small number of senior government officials into mountain bunkers uh, and a really sort of odd and fascinating arrangement of vehicles uh, and facilities that the president uh, and the presidential successors would be evacuated to. Um, and, and so this is really sort of the story of uh, in, in my mind, this shift of the, uh, of the office of the president from someone who we think of as the person that we elect every four years on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November to this apparatus that actually now encompasses several hundred people in Washington. Uh, and that the presidency now never ceases even when the president uh, himself dies. And so you have you know, the 20 or so positions of the line of succession that we all know from the 25th Amendment of the vice president, the speaker of the house, the president pro tem of the Senate, on down to the cabinet. But then each of those cabinet agencies has its own line of succession. And so you know, for each of those jobs, you have 15, 20 people in lines of succession coming down from there. And so when you look at sort of what the presidency encompasses today and sort of the realm of the people who might be in charge after uh, a particularly catastrophic uh, emergency in the United States, you know, you're talking about 400 people. Uh, um, and, you know, that's not the way that most of us think of the presidency, but it's part of what is actually sort of a pretty mystical idea, which is, you know, you have the body of the president, but then you have sort of this spiritual idea of the presidency, such that the presidency is never vacant, no matter sort of how far down that list you have to go. You do a nice job in the book of, I think, invoking at sort of key moments this phrase of the king is dead, long live the king, as a sort of the ways in which this process you're talking about now is a sort of like modern incarnation of a sort of like uh, dynastic succession yep. um, as you know was practiced in monarchies uh, in years past. Uh, you mentioned about 400 people, uh, and you did not say, interestingly, 400 people and their families. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the, uh, the sort of like basic failures of planning that seemed to recur over the span of decades that was, that was shocking to me. That these plans would be made for where it's like, okay, if you are the you know, deputy attorney general or the head of the FBI or you, you know, have a slot in you know, this bunker, that's, but your family doesn't. And routinely, and you, you have like lots of really good interviews in the book where you either talk to people or find documents or have spoken to someone else and they'll say, yeah, I wasn't going to go without, I wasn't going like, to leave my wife and children. Typically, it was a wife and children. Historically, mm -hmm. these were generally men. I mean, I'm not just assuming, but this, this is a story in there. Uh, behind and, and save my own hide. Uh, and I guess I'm curious, like that's a, I mean there's all kinds of chaotic things that one can't foresee about what things would look like in nuclear war. But the fact that planners sort of like 
just neglected this like pretty profound emotional commitment that most people have to their families mm -hmm. was sort of somehow telling to me. Um, yeah, yeah, and and it is it, it, it's part of the core challenge that all of these plans struggle with throughout the Cold War, which is uh, the intersection of well organized paper plans and basic human psychology, uh, where you you know. Broadly speaking, you know, these continuity of government programs uh, unfolded you know, for decades. Uh, we spent tens of billions, probably 100 or 200 billion dollars total um, on these plans and these endeavors and these facilities. And yet like everyone who ever looked at them was able to come up with really obvious things that they didn't do. Um, chief among them, uh, the, the challenge of evacuating families. And, and this is literally something that occurs during the very first evacuation drill during the Eisenhower years in the 1950s, Operation Alert. The, we used to run uh, in the 1950s uh, these incredibly elaborate national evacuation and civil defense drills. And you would have, I mean, the entire country involved. I mean, the stock exchange would shut down. Uh, you know, every taxi in New York City would pull over and drop off its passengers and they would go into fallout shelters. And everyone on every bus in New York City would be dropped off at the curb and given a special bus pass to be allowed back onto the bus at the conclusion of the evacuation drill. Um, and during that very first Operation Alert, uh, there's sort of this moment that is captured in the newspapers at the time where all of the wives of the cabinet sit there and watch their husbands be evacuated by helicopter and limousine uh, across the city and they play poker together and, uh, the, and, and sort of uh, don't love the idea that their husbands are being evacuated away, particularly when they discover that all of their husbands' secretaries are also being evacuated. Uh, because, you know, memos right. don't type themselves in the bunker. Uh, and so this is something that recurs sort of time and time again, and it comes up in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, where you have officials who are pretty wary of you know, whether they actually go to the bunkers and leave their families behind in Washington to come what may. This is still a problem in our modern plans. I talked to someone in the book who uh, was uh, part of these continuity of government plans and procedures during the Obama administration. I mean, up until, you know, 127 days ago or so, something like that. that. Um, but, you know, so, uh, you know, these plans still all exist, and uh, you know, I was out on the streets today and saw the blue and gold helicopters from the first Air Force helicopter squadron flying above the cap uh, flying above the city today, and like those are up there practicing to evacuate high-level government officials every day over the skies in Washington. Like anytime you see them, they're the only helicopters that fly low and over the city that are not the. DC police helicopter uh, or the park police helicopter. And like what they're doing up there is practicing being ready to evacuate. So this guy that I spoke with, you know, there was a, one of those designated helicopters was going to land wherever he was and evacuate him to one of these bunkers. And he told me like, you know, it, he's got two young daughters and he's like, if that, helicopter lands on my daughter's soccer field on a Saturday morning, like there's no way that I am waving goodbye to my daughters on the sideline of the soccer game and like getting in that helicopter and flying away. And like it, it's just sort of this funny thing where sort of over time there are some very minor accommodations made for families. Right. Um, that, Congress at least expanded their bunker at the Greenbrier, um, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, so that it could accommodate families. Um, 
Although notably, the family accommodations are outside of the blast doors. So you could get really close to the bunker and have a bunk bed, but like if the nuclear bomb hit really close, you're, you're, you're still not uh, surviving. Um, and then after the Cuban Missile Crisis, this, uh, the, at least for the White House, uh, they decided that White House families and sort of cabinet families would report separately to uh, Fort Reno. Um, so that uh, if, if you know Fort Reno um, up uh, with, by AU, uh, there, there, that series of water towers that you That's see up the there. That's the highest point in DC. It's the highest point in DC. Um, so uh, the tallest building there is not actually a water tower. It's built to look like a water tower but it's actually one of these continuity of government facilities and was part of the presidential communications network that existed um, during most of the Cold War. And there was sort of a whole series of those blast hardened towers around the Capitol, uh, stretching out to Raven Rock, stretching out to Mount Weather, stretching out to some of these other facilities. Um, and so the idea was that the families of White House and cabinet officials would report there uh, and then would be sort of like put on buses and bussed out to other facilities. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, numbers obviously multiply. People have families, uh, but that, so some of this historical was sort of, reasoning was just purely logistical, that like, well, we have a limited amount of space. Uh, but the, the sort of the way you put it in the subtitle that, you know, you're saving your own skin while the rest of us die. And I wonder if, you know, if one's family is brought along too, it, it even more explicitly introduces that sort of like distinction of like we're saving ourselves rather than a we are absolutely necessary to the functioning of this. Yeah, of this and, and that and that was the argument all along was that uh, you know families are not necessary to the continuation of the United States, and I think that sort of part of what's interesting about thinking through these plans is the extent to which this question of what are you going what are you going to preserve about America very quickly becomes a pretty existential question about what is America. You know, are you trying to preserve the presidency? Are you trying to preserve the three branches of government? Uh, are you trying to preserve the totems of our history? Um, so, you know, yes, there was a set of these plans about evacuating the president and the cabinet and the uh, members of Congress. There was also a set of these plans where the National Archives sat down and decided that it was going to evacuate the Declaration of Independence before it would evacuate the Constitution. That the uh, Library of Congress decided it would evacuate the Lincoln's Gettysburg Address before it evacuated uh, the uh, George Washington's military commission. And one of one of my favorite details in, in the whole book is that through the Cold War, there was a specially trained team of park rangers in Philadelphia whose job it was to evacuate the Liberty Bell in the event of a Soviet nuclear attack. And sort of the idea that there would be these, you know, sort of to mix my metaphors here, like in that scene uh, where like, in the movie Independence Day, Bill Pullman is standing in the back of the pickup truck, like rallying the country to, you know, for its new fight for freedom. Like, what are the things that Bill Pullman should have with him that he can point to to be like, this is still America? And the answers are like the Liberty Bell, the Declaration of Independence, and like a president of the United States. Um, so a president is, is an interesting turn of phrase. And that struck me as one of the other sort of major psychological flaws that persisted through decades. Because a, a lot of these plans, and I want to get to this, are the sort of like chaos of chaotic situations fall apart for sort of chaos is difficult to manage. Uh, but there are some flaws that are just obvious, just with the families that we were discussing. The other is the enormous amount of effort that's put you know, above everything before the Constitution, before the Liberty Bell, on protecting the life of the president uh, and taking the president to somewhere where he can communicate. Mm -hmm. um, most presidents seemed pretty uninterested uh, in this, uh, both as a matter of, uh, despite the many resources being spent budgetarily on like actually spending time like doing the drills, uh, 
And part of the reason they didn't want to spend time doing the drills is this recurring thing of presidents being like, you know what, like get the vice president out, yeah. or secretaries of defense being like, yeah, the deputy secretary of defense, and you know this sort of like a captain goes down with his ship uh, idea. Um, and that seems, and I'm trying to remember it in the book, some presidents were sort of more adamant about this than, than, than others. I mean, is this, could you, is it fair to say that uniformly presidents sort of wanted to go down while, while I mean, it's this sort of tension between being able to communicate uh, and being able to survive. Yes, and, um, and that's exactly, the, that's the, one of the central tensions in so much of this planning is that you can either you can't both be secure and be in communication. And you, you saw that actually really come, to the, uh, come true on 9-11 when we were able to get President Bush into Air Force One and up into the sky where he was safe uh, in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, but that came at the cost of him being able to be in command and in control of the US government apparatus that was unfolding uh, on the ground before him, both in the like actual terms, I mean like literally being out of communication, but also being invisible to the country um, and sort of out of touch at a really crucial moment. And then that was sort of true throughout these real crisis moments during the Cold War where you see Truman and Carter and, uh, and Kennedy uh, in these, uh, you know, sort of the heat of the moment make a decision that they're gonna stay at the White House, they're going to die, and that there are going to be other people that they ship off to, uh, to the cold, uh, you know, to the bunkers. And that that is very much part of the actual planning during the Cold War, that you end up with the A-team of the presidency, which is the person that is actually elected, and then the B-team, which are, uh, which is basically the vice president and the speaker of the house, and then the C-team, which are like the cabinet officials who sort of scatter to the wind, and you hope that you know they end up in a bunker in Denton, Texas, or Maynard, Massachusetts, uh, or up in the presidential doomsday planes, the airborne command posts, and that like one of them is left alive at the end of this. And this is where you end up with this um, program that grew out of the 1980s during the Reagan years uh, that I actually think is really important to trying to understand the way that we reacted to 9-11. Uh, which was known as the Presidential Successor Support System, PS3, uh, which was an entirely classified program at the time that had former high-ranking government officials uh, like Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, people who had been White House Chiefs of Staff, who had been Cabinet Secretaries, uh, actually waiting, uh, actually uh, being evacuated from their civilian private lives into these bunkers uh, to be the White House Chief of Staff uh, in waiting. Um, and so the idea was that if you were the Agriculture Secretary, if you were the Commerce Secretary, if you were sort of one of these designated survivors, designated successors uh, who had you know, just no idea what you were doing running the government, no idea about the, the nuclear authorities or the, our defense capabilities. Like, don't worry, like Dick Cheney or Donald Rumsfeld would be waiting in the bunker to run your government. Um, and, uh, and they drilled this. I mean, every year they, uh, you know, these official, you know, uh, Dick Cheney was in the private sector, and Donald, uh, Dick Cheney, I think, was a congressman during part of this. Um, Donald Rumsfeld was a CEO, and they would just disappear from their lives for, you know, on a Tuesday morning, and no one would know where they were, um, and they would run off and run these exercises for a few days or a few weeks. Um, um, so it was 1980s, it was the Reagan years. Um, but we don't know, but part of this that's uh, interesting, of course, is we don't know whether there are modern analogs to this. So we don't know, 
whether, uh, you know, if Ben Carson or Betsy DeVos ends up in a bunker somewhere, uh, whether a Dennis McDonough or an Andy Card might be like standing there, you know, hi, I'm your new White House Chief of Staff, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm ready to run the government. Um, and, uh, and so, in, in some ways, I hope that there is a, a version of that program that still exists today. Um, well, I mean, one of the things that I really loved about the book is, is the way, I mean, I think so much of this sort of like secret history, just sort of like getting it out into public is, you know, to the extent that, that, that you've succeeded, which is, is large, is, is sort of interesting in and of itself as a sort of like quirky, you know, here's a, you know, you mentioned on 9-11, I don't know, Air, the Air Force One took off like very quickly in Florida using like a system that had, hadn't been seen in public before. And that's just, that's just like interesting on mm -hmm. the face of it. But this, wh what you alluded to now is a sort of like existential lens onto American society, uh, I thought was really powerful in, in the book. Um, you talked, I think, different from this system in the 1980s, Earlier on, if I'm remembering in the 50s uh, under Eisenhower, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a sort of a system of cards basically given to sort of captains of industry mm -hmm. who had a sort of like shadow czar, like you're gonna run all the transportation in the mm -hmm. country like in the, in the nuclear emergency. And the fact that that was like almost certainly not constitutional or legal, but was just done um, and sort of that system and whatever anal modern day analog might exist sort of gets at the relationship between industry and government, mm -hmm. which I think is a lot more complicated than, than many people like want to let on, in, even in their own minds in this town. So I'm curious about this sort of like relationship between industry and government, like yeah. as seen through the lens of this story. And, and I think that it, you're right, that this ends up being uh, a, a, a surprising th thread through the story is the role of the private sector in these plans uh, in, in a couple of sort of different buckets where you, know, you have a, a set of companies that are really, really tightly involved in these plans. I mean, AT&T uh, ran dozens of these government bunkers. I mean, they were actually government, they were actually AT&T <laughs> facilities um, you know, AT&T employees uh, fully staffing these communications bunkers up and down the East Coast um, and sort of stretching uh, out into the West. Uh, and then you have sort of a bunch of other companies uh, that just have large roles in American society who go out and set up their own bunkers. Um, you know, Westinghouse and General Electric and uh, all of these other uh, companies around the country have their own relocation bunkers. Um, uh, IBM kept a relocation bunker where you know, each vice president in descending order had a slightly smaller desk uh, and you know, they even kept the name tags you know, fully updated at, on each desk so that you know, everyone would know precisely what their desk was in the bunker. Um, and then, uh, and then you have, uh, as you said, these private individuals who are brought into these plans, both at very high levels, where, as you say, during the Eisenhower years, there was a set of nine uh, CEOs, uh, mostly CEOs, although one of them was actually uh, Eisenhower's personal accountant. Uh, who were going to be deputized, who had been deputized. I mean, they had the, uh, you know, they had the paperwork uh, to, and would step in as super czars to run all of the nation's manufacturing, all of the nation's transportation, all of the nation's housing, um, you know, all of the nation's food. Uh, and each of them would sort of be given a sector of the U.S. economy to run until some point in the future where we could return to basic capitalism. So you have that on like the high level, and then and, on and the- And I guess at that time, you know, World War II was still like fresh in people's yes. minds. And like 
an analog, like a smaller scale analog of that, like had run the American yep. economy for a few years. Um, and, and, and even, uh, you know, and that sort of proceeds through every sector. So you had journalists in Washington who were pre deputized, uh, you know, Washington bureau chiefs and network vice presidents who were pre deputized uh, as the wartime censors who would step in and you know, censor uh, their colleagues' work. And you even had an emergency press pool uh, who uh, would be designated uh, to be evacuated along with the president and designated successors so that there was sort of always a reporter somewhere close to the president to receive whatever press releases the US government was handing out. Um, so you have sort of that on like the one national level, but then like down on the like local level, like you could also get, you know, emergency evacuation passes if you owned a bulldozer, because like you would need like we would need a lot of bulldozers after nuclear war, and so we were interested in ensuring that people who knew how to drive bulldozers survived the war, um, and uh, you know. It, this is, again, all continuing to the present day. I don't know whether bulldoze, bulldozer drivers still get evacuation passes, but like, uh, there are all sorts of special relationships uh, with defense contractors and communications companies around the modern day analog of these plans. Um, and you know, CenturyLink right now is laying new communications cables to Raven Rock, uh, like right now, overnight tonight, uh, through the center of Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, as part of like CenturyLink, big integration into this plan. So as we move towards the present day, sort of uh, in the book, uh, I want to talk about well, Congress first, uh, and you know the, the other branches of government. Um, I think you know, rel the sort of green, the story of the Greenbrier, uh, which you tell very nicely in the book, was sort of like already known probably more, perhaps of all the Cold War bunkers, the, right. the one about which the most has been written publicly. Um, and you, you sort of speculate towards the end of the book that the, the Gang of Eight, who have been you know, much in the news as of late, uh, may have a, a sort of like special role in you know what you what you uh, refer to as enduring constitutional government yep. uh, about which little is known and I'm sort of just wondering if you could sort of like tell us what couldn't make it into the book but you sort of like could establish a little bit on what the legislature would look like in you know in the event of you know one of these cat cataclysmic events yeah. coming past so w one of the things that I think is Im important to understand about the legacy of these plans is it's really during the Cold War where you begin to see the balance of power between the legislative branch and the executive branch tip pretty dramatically towards the executive branch. That uh, the idea of war as we have understood it throughout our history has always been something that Congress was involved in, that it was uh, you know, Congress that declared war. Um, Eisenhower makes very clear, and this is now sort of commonly accepted, uh, you know, nuclear procedures, that like nuclear war is the president's personal prerogative. Um, and so we end up with like this very weird imbalance in modern life where like if the president wants to send a few hundred troops to another country, like, Theoretically, he needs congressional permission to do that. But if he wants to destroy every living thing on the planet, he can do that by himself at any time, anywhere in the world. Um, and so Congress understands this and is pretty uninterested in being part of the continuity planning through much of the Cold War because they understand that there's just not much of a role for them. And, uh, you know, Congress moves slowly and requires, uh, you know, some level of consensus. And, uh, you know, it might be months uh, before Congress sort of got, gets back to 
really functioning in the way that it was pre-war, and that by that point, sort of all of the big decisions would be made by the executive branch anyway. And so it was really with great reluctance that Congress even bothered to build the Greenbrier itself. Uh, but you know, Congress at the time was not even going to be particularly well served by the Greenbrier. Uh, if war happened while Congress was in session, they would be taken down to Union Station and put on a special train uh, out to the Greenbrier. Well, that presupposed uh, the amount of time it would take to get a train to Union Station and get it out of the blast zone in Washington, which was unlikely for a variety of reasons. Um, and then if Congress, if war happened when Congress was not in session, uh, no members of Congress other than the senior leadership were actually told where the bunker was at all. And so the procedures were that, the, that members of Congress after nuclear war were to find their local FBI field office where there would be sealed envelopes waiting for them with instructions of how to report to the Greenbrier. Um, and so that sort of, that plan had its own yeah. shortcomings. Uh, the modern version of these plans, though, uh, I think are, are pretty interesting insofar as what we know. So you have, as you mentioned, the most secretive level of these plans today are called Enduring Constitutional Government, ECG. And that is, the level, that, that is the set of plans that deal with how the three branches of government would work together. And from what little we know, they bear almost no resemblance to normal modern government. Um, and that they are entirely geared at preserving the spirit of the Constitution, not the letter of the Constitution. And that they seem to imply some type of super empowered responsibility for some very small number of surviving members of Congress uh, that might be as small as one to four to eight members of Congress. Uh, and sort of one of the hints that we have of this is, uh, you know, everyone in Washington sort of knows the, the parlor game of who the designated survivor is at a State of the Union or a uh, presidential inauguration, sort of the member of the cabinet who gets uh, hidden away in a bunker. Well, beginning in 2002, uh, after 9-11, we begin hiding away one member of Congress also and there is now a designated survivor for Congress also. Uh, the first one in 2002 was Tom DeLay, um, uh, the minority whip at the time. And so, so like that naturally begs the question, like what good is one member of Congress if everyone else is dead? Like a, one member of Congress can't do anything. It's not even two members of Congress, like one from each uh, right. body. And so you can sort of tell that there's some type of special powers that those people uh, receive in the wake of the activation of ECG. Uh, and we just don't know exactly what that means. And, I, and, I, and, and that to me is one of the weird troubling problems with, these, uh, with the modern set of these plans, which is I get that there's all sorts of reasons for tactical secrecy around certain aspects of these plans. Um, you know, who exactly is going to be evacuated where? Uh, you know, what are the communication capabilities of specific vehicles or specific facilities? But it does sort of seem like we could know who potentially could be in charge after nuclear war. And it seems like that might be something that is worth uh, not just knowing, but having a chance to debate uh, and discuss up front, in part so that those people have legitimacy after an incident where they pop up and say, like, don't worry, I have this official looking piece of paper here that says that I'm the person in charge and that I have all of these special powers 
that you have never heard anything about? Yeah, I mean, when the 25th Amendment was passed, I mean, there was a realization that, like, I mean, it seems bizarre, but it's just a testimony to how long ago uh, 1787 was that the Constitution really doesn't like adequately provide for the succession of the vice presidency, which is just like, like they just like from the modern eye, it looks like they just kind of forgot about it, which is crazy. Um, and when we sort of realized that this was a problem, there was a, you know, public discussion, and the Twenty Fifth Amendment was passed. Uh, and is like there's nothing like it's it's there, you know, after all the other amendments and you know before the ones that came after it. Um, it seems just sort of like fundamentally not okay that all of these plans, I mean, sort of just echoing your comments now, and I'm, I guess I'm curious what, I mean, there doesn't seem to be any sort of political constituency for doing anything about it, maybe for fear of sort of like being seen as a nut job talking about the, you know, the apocalypse. Yeah. Oh. It, it, and again, like, there, there's a whole set of questions about things we don't know about. You raised the 25th Amendment. Uh, there are problems that we know about the 25th Amendment uh, right now. Like, it, it is actually not at all clear from the Constitution that the Speaker of the House or the President pro tem of the Senate are legally allowed to serve as President of the United States. Um, no less in authority on the Constitution than James Madison himself is on the record arguing that the Speaker of the House and the President pro tem of the Senate are ineligible to serve as President of the United States. Uh, the, the short uh, argument being that only members of the executive branch are eligible to head the executive branch and that you can't bring in members of the legislative branch uh, who are not constitutional officers for the executive branch in order to it's more, it's slightly more complicated than that, but that's the short version of it. Well, so we re we remember the the like mockery of Al Haig during the Reagan assassination attempt of him standing there and saying like I'm in control here at the White House uh, when he was like not just not in charge there at the White House, but was actually like fourth or fifth in line for being in charge. Um, well, but it turns out that like, if something happens to the president and vice president, uh, the Secretary of State has a pretty good argument that he is the next president of the United States. And so it's not that hard to imagine a scenario where uh, you have a 35-year-old army captain standing watch at Raven Rock, uh, the relocation facility for the Pentagon, uh, with Rex Tillerson on one phone and Paul Ryan on the other, each of them claiming to be the legitimate president of the United States and to have nuclear command authority. Um, and like, I don't really think we should be waiting until that moment to rely upon the constitutional judgment of that 35-year-old army officer uh, standing watch on that particular shift uh, at Raven Rock or Mount Weather or on the presidential doomsday plane. Uh, like, that seems like in a question that we could actually answer right now. Right. Uh, and, like, again, those are the questions that arise of the things that we know about. So, like, what are the questions that would arise about the things that we don't know about? So I want to give the third branch of government equal time and then uh, open it up to, uh, to, to questions so that other people get a chance, because I got questions for you all night. Um, but I mean, the body, sort of like a natural, the, the people who would like, at least you know, if there was time and if they were in communication, uh, to resolve these sorts of questions uh, is the Supreme Court. And you tell a sort of like very interesting uh, history interwoven of the Supreme Court's plans over time where you know, there's certain sort of periods where they're like, all right, like we too need a plan and like we need a really good law library because like we want to do a good job. So, you know, they find like small colleges, I think in North Carolina and they like, you know, someone from the court goes down and like, is their library good enough? Like, and they're like, yeah, I guess it is. And then, and then like at other times where there's this almost like nihilism on the part of the court, it's like, you know what? Like 
if the world goes to hell, no one's going to listen to us anyway, so yep. like, why bother? Yeah. <laughs> it, um, so the, there are two, uh, as I was writing this book and sort of doing the research, there were two Christopher Guest movies that came, uh, came to mind in this. One was uh, the Supreme Court relocating to this luxury mountain resort, the Grove Park in, in Asheville, North Carolina, which some of you might have been to at one point. It's this beautiful inn up on a hill, great golf course. Um, better than the Greenbrier? Uh, not, not better than the Greenbrier, but actually uh, designed uh, by uh, the same person. And they, uh, and sort of the idea of like the Supreme Court like having the court, uh, holding court in these reception halls. Um, and then the other, which, and this is a digression, then I'll come back to the Supreme Court. So the National Gallery built a farm uh, out in the Virginia farm country uh, that was like the curator's cottage that they fully stocked and then had all of these secure vaults for the paintings of the National Gallery. Um, and I, I just sort of have these ideas of this like Christopher Guest movie about like the Supreme Court in this like luxury mountain resort amid nuclear war and then this different movie uh, of the like National Gallery curator like sitting there eating his dinner on this like farm with all of these priceless yeah. paintings all around him as nuclear war breaks out all around. So the Supreme Court was just not uh, exact for the reasons that you say, like the Supreme Court works even more slowly than Congress. And so the Supreme Court made a pretty quick decision that they were just going to be completely irrelevant during uh, the Cold War. Um, which was reinforced because all of the drills were during the summer when the, when the Supreme Court is on recess. And so the Su Supreme Court justices didn't see any reason to return to Washington just to evacuate. And so they never participated in any of the drills. But Earl Warren, when he was Chief Justice, uh, you know, was given one of these emergency passes. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, uh, I don't see a pass here for Mrs. Warren. And the uh, officer from, it was the forerunner of FEMA, FEMA's the agency that runs all of these plans, uh, says, um, well, you know, sir, you are one of the most important officials in the US government, so you get a pass. And he said, well, if there's no pass for Mrs. Warren, then I guess you'll have room for another really important person. Um, and that's been effectively there uh, their plan all the way through. Um, now again, like these plans, particularly when you get to modern day uh, and we begin to think about the continuity of Congress and the continuity of the executive branch, like they intersect in really complicated uh, and, and challenging ways. And someone's uh, got to swear in a new president. It, well, so uh, someone, uh, you know, you need sort of someone in that role, but also, uh, you know, so the Supreme Court is theoretically the person that Rex Tillerson and Paul Ryan would go to to say which one of us is president. Um, what happens if you've lost more than three Supreme Court justices uh, in whatever this attack is and the Supreme Court doesn't even have a quorum in order to answer that question? Take some questions, uh, gentlemen in front, and then back, and we'll work our way back. Hi, I'm Robert Schroeder with International Investor. I, uh, not having read your book, uh, let me let me get to the second part of the uh, the subtitle, and you know the rest of us left to die. It's one thing if we're just left on our own outside of these you know people who are favored for the bunkers. It's another thing if we're hampered from evacuation. I, I was sharing with the audience an experience I had where I saw Route 66 closed down completely from traffic in order to let some VIP traffic through. Mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine the reverse easily happening. And let me, let me create a scenario for you and ask you to comment. Let's say instead of nuclear, we have a biological attack. There's more time involved, but clearly there's a very contagious lethal disease and they have time now to assemble all the members of Congress, Supreme Court, anyone else who can and will. But are, do you envision a situation where perhaps the rest of uh, 
the rest of society is hampered from an evacuation in order to first get the VIPs out. So this is, this is an interesting uh, question, uh, in part because uh, for everyone uh, here in this room, at least, who lives in Washington, uh, you know how any rainstorm or minor snow flurry uh, reduces the city to complete and total gridlock uh, during absolutely non-panic times. Um, and so the government ends up with these incredibly detailed plans about how to evacuate uh, urban areas. Um, and uh, the, the plan for DC you know, has every ward going out different roads in different directions, um, which then sort of makes sense on paper, but then when you actually are reading the plan, like two of the wards cross perpendicularly uh, outside seven corners. Um, so you can like imagine how quickly that comes to a halt uh, as uh, you know, two fleeing populaces have to uh, come to a four-way stop. And, uh, but these plans, uh, you know, really drive and change over the course of the Cold War, uh, which is sort of one of the reasons that the president ends up with all of these different vehicles. Um, you know, we, we, one of the things that we sort of forget about is that basically everything that we think of as part of the modern majestic imperial presidency is a fancy tool to launch nuclear weapons from wherever the president is. Um, Marine One, Air Force One, the armored motorcades are effectively just secure tools to ensure that the president is in communication with the national command authorities wherever he is in the world. And you know, the first presidential helicopter flight uh, is as part of one of these evacuation drills uh, because of expressly the fear of traffic gridlock on the roads would, uh, you know, requires the president to take to the sky. Uh, a, a funny digression uh, here uh, for people in Washington because you know how government works and you know how sort of inadvertent decisions end up creating long-standing traditions. Um, the Air Force was actually supposed to fly the president in helicopters uh, and the first presidential helicopter flight uh, during Operation Alert 1957 uh, was aboard uh, an Air Force helicopter. The Air Force bought two presidential helicopters and they were those sort of plexiglass bubble helicopters that you would remember from the opening scenes of MASH. And uh, as I was previously saying, these drills always took place during the summer. Uh, and you know how hot Washington summers are, particularly if you put someone in a plexiglass bubble uh, for 45 minutes uh, on their way to Camp David. So these, uh, Eisenhower gets in the helicopter, it takes off, and he bakes every second of the flight to Camp David. And the helicopter lands, and he says, uh, you know, I'm never getting in that infernal contraption again. Uh, and so the Air Force didn't have any larger helicopters at the time. And so the next time the president needs to fly in a helicopter, uh, he gets in a marine transport helicopter, and yada, 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 that's how we have Marine One. Um, and so like, if the Air Force had had an air conditioner uh, aboard their helicopter in July 1957, uh, the Air Force would probably still be flying the president of the United States. Um, but these plans, uh, I think sort of one of the things that is so interesting about these is, you know, we've, we've spent most of this time talking about, uh, you know, sort of the nuclear uh, command side of this. But when you begin to talk about the civilian population, the way that it would unfold after nuclear war, um, you know, every aspect of government 
had its own post-nuclear uh, uh, war role. So uh, the post office was the agency that was going to be in charge of registering the dead uh, and coming up with the uh, list of people who had survived. So getting into prop time. So this is form uh, 810 of the US Postal Service, which is you would receive this postcard when you reported to a refugee camp in the United States. And on the back here, uh, you would write down the members of your family that uh, were still alive in that particular refugee camp. And then it would be mailed off uh, to, other, to your other surviving families and the post office would figure out where they were in other refugee camps. Uh, and they would, uh, uh, you know, this is sort of how the country would reassemble. The uh, post office is also meant to deliver vaccines. Well, so, the, so yeah. the, and, and, and so during the Cold War, you had sort of all of these sets of plans of, you know, the Park Service would run the refugee camps uh, because the Park Service, uh, Park Service land wasn't going to be targeted during a war. So you would flee out into the Blue Ridge Mountains or Yosemite, and your friendly neighborhood park rangers would be standing there to usher you into the uh, post-war apocalypse. And... Uh, then, of course, you know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture was the agency that was going to be in charge of feeding uh, and rations. Uh, and uh, the IRS, you know, had its own sets of plans about how they would levy taxes on nuclear damaged property and institute a national sales tax um, uh, in order to raise revenue after a war. Um, because not even nuclear war stops the IRS. So all of these plans, though, have been updated and modernized for the, uh, for, for the modern threats. So the post office sort of doesn't have like a bunch of these forms anymore for figuring out who is still alive in the United States. But they are the designated agency for distributing medical countermeasures in the event of, as you mentioned, a biological attack or a public health pandemic. So like the next time you are thinking about like what your holiday tip to your postman or postwoman should be, like remember that's the person who's going to bring you the Ebola vaccine. And you definitely want to be on the like earlier side of receiving the Ebola vaccine. Uh, no, they, they, were, they were actually very, you know, they, they really uh, thought this through and they decided that it wasn't going to be fair to use uh, pre-disaster tax valuations. Uh, and instead, you, uh, they would have to sort of reassess everyone's taxes after nuclear war. Um, but, there, but, you know, sort of all of these plans have these weird, wacky little quirks to them. So the, uh, the Federal Reserve had its bunker in Mount Pony, Virginia, um, uh, about 90 minutes south of, of Washington. That's now the Library of Congress uh, audiovisual archive. And uh, they, it, you know, they had a bunker where the Fed chair and the Board of Governors and uh, all of those high-level officials would go. They also had a bunker of about $2 billion cash that uh, would serve to bridge the currency needs of the country during what they calculated were the 18 months before the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Uh, well, so what, what's funny, though, about this is, again, like in the way that the government makes decisions, um, that $2 billion was in $2 bills because during the 1970s, when they first introduced the $2 bill and like no one in America wanted to use a $2 bill, uh, they were like, well, what can we do with a whole bunch of surplus $2 bills? And they're like, we'll save them for the nuclear war. Um, and so once you would have no choice about which currency you were using, we would all be happy using $2 bills. All right, uh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Simone Williams. I'm a student at American University. I have two very brief questions, if you allow me. Sure. Um, so my first question is, um, if either in the book or through your research, if you found anything about um, the continuity of government 
during a transition period, so mm -hmm. i.e. either before inauguration or after inauguration, when those deputies aren't filled and things of that nature. And then my second question for you is um, a little bit more on your thoughts on what, like with Congress and um, the Supreme Court stepping aside in the beginning of the Cold War saying, uh, we're not needed at this portion. Like, what does that truly say about what we think America is? Because when you think if the Declaration of Independence is one of those um, important documents, that's the balance of government, which requires all three branches, but yet two out of the three branches are stepping aside. Yeah, and, and, and I think that that's sort of part of what's really interesting about this is, uh, you know, figuring out this balance, which I don't think we ever figured out, and I don't have any reason to believe we have figured out now, uh, between preserving the spirit of the Constitution and the letter of the Constitution um, during one of these disaster times. And, and you know, we haven't even gotten into sort of the attendant issues of this, which is, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that any sort of large-scale disaster would involve the suspension of habeas corpus, the declaration of martial law, um, sort of the suspension of all of these civil liberties that we normally consider pretty central to our, the functioning of our democracy. Um, you know, during the Cold War, uh, you know, we're all familiar with the president's football, the nuclear briefcase that follows the president. Well, the attorney general during the Cold War had his own sort of attorney general's football that was filled with all of these pre-written executive orders and uh, proclamations suspending habeas corpus, declaring martial law, uh, providing for the roundup of uh, thousands of pre-selected subversives, uh, you know, declaring that foreign, uh, people of foreign nationalities had to register with the government immediately after a, a you know, declaration of war. I mean, sort of all of these things that we under normal circumstances would think would be ab uh, you know, abhorrent to our civil liberties. Um, and then your first question about the transition, and so the transitions are particularly strange moments uh, in the already wacky world of uh, government continuity programs. Uh, and, and actually, uh, Norm Ornstein uh, here in Washington has done a lot of work on this, particularly after 9-11, and sort of pointing out, like, this is not the functioning government that we actually think we would want if an attack happened on an inauguration. Uh, because, and, and again, I, I am not a constitutional scholar, uh, so I'm briefly summarizing pretty complex uh, legal questions, but like sort of the gist of it is basically if something happens during an inauguration, well, then it falls back on the most senior ranking Senate confirmed person of the previous administration. And so like if something had happened during the 2001 transition from Clinton to Bush, uh, we would have actually ended up with President Larry Summers uh, being sworn in rather than George W. Bush uh, because Madeleine Albright as Secretary of State at that point was born overseas and so Larry Summers was sort of the most senior uh, official who would have stepped into that void and like everyone who was expecting George W. Bush as president would have been pretty surprised uh, to discover Larry Summers, uh, who has a couple of ideological differences uh, that, that he would have led the nation forward with. And this was operative in the real world, right? Yeah, th the, this is still the, uh, operative in the real the, world, uh, yeah. Uh, with a, there was a delayed, I remember in the book you mentioned a delayed resignation until like yep. a day after the, yep. I remember if it was Gates? Yeah, and so, well, and so during 09, uh, you know, you had Gates carry over, right. and so you know Bob Gates would have been president of the United States. Right. Uh, uh, we uh, the, the two gentlemen in the back, and then we'll work our way back forward. So, sir, yeah. uh, Harry Jaffe. Uh, Garrett was my editor at Washingtonian Magazine. Those were those days. Um, I have two very Homer questions. Um, I live in Clark County, Virginia, uh, in the shadow of Mount Weather, and there's a local myth that there's a tunnel 
from Washington, D.C., 60 miles out to Mount Weather? Did you find any tunnels? Um, so, uh, so there are rumors both of that tunnel and then there's a rumored tunnel between Camp David and Raven Rock. Um, and uh, I, have, I have no reason to believe that such tunnels exist, uh, in part because uh, such a tunnel would be such a massive undertaking engineering-wise. Uh, and that based on the extensive newspaper coverage of the original excavation of Raven Rock, it seems hard to imagine that an even larger tunnel would have remained hidden. Um, but what they did do uh, at, at Raven Rock, um, they might still do it, I, I don't know, um, but there are these massive reservoirs, I mean lake-sized reservoirs inside uh, Raven Rock for, uh, for drinking water, for the heating and cooling systems. And they uh, would run pranks on the new security forces and tell them that they were running submarine drills and to go stand on the edge of the reservoir and to report back when the president's submarine arrived from Camp David. While we're on tunnel questions quickly, you mentioned towards the end of the book a construction in East Potomac Park for like a decade. Any sense of what that construction is? Um, I yeah, so there's, the book, uh, um, so there have been all sorts of these programs, or uh, all sorts of these facilities have been sort of built and expanded, particularly on the communication side uh, since 9-11. Raven Rock uh, has had hundreds of thousands of square feet uh, of office space added to it in Pennsylvania. Um, and then there was a year and a half long construction project, which some of you might have even noticed, on the uh, north lawn of the White House, where they dug this enormous hole in the lawn, spent 18 months lowering massive blocks of concrete down into it, um, and told us that they were repairing the air conditioning system. Um, and then, as you say, there's been another facility that the Navy has been building uh, for the better part of a decade in East Potomac Park uh, that has something to do Up with... Up until 2014, it, yeah, to be clear, uh, like that, recently. Um, that has something to do with continuity of government, something to do with communication systems. Uh, but where that tunnel actually goes... Um, we, we don't know, although it does seem that that tunneling is responsible for some of the settling of that whole spit of land mm -hmm. out there, uh, including the settling uh, around the Jefferson Memorial. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my neighbors literally work at Mount Weather, um, but I don't have I don't work there. I don't have an invitation. Uh, I would imagine in the end of a in, in the event of a, of a war, there's a big, you know crosshair on Mount Weather. Is that, do you have any sense of whether that's true? So th they're actually, so this was actually a doctrine question during the Cold War, um, where the, it, in a confusing way that sort of only begins to make sense in the confusing world of nuclear strategy, uh, of mutually assured destruction, uh, the thinking was that you wouldn't actually target the hardened command centers of each country uh, because you'd need someone to turn war off after war has started. Um, and so there was a, there, there was sort of a conscious doctrine, whether it or not it was actually true, um, you know, or would have held true, we don't, uh, you know. No, you're, uh, well, so, but one of the funny things with Mount Weather is uh, uh, it, it does seem pretty clear that the Russians knew about it pretty early. Um, and Mount Weather being in, in Bluemont, Virginia, the major president's uh, evacuation bunker, and the Russians actually tried to buy a vacation house, or what they declared would be a vacation house, that just so happened to be super close to Mount Weather. Um, in the 1970s, and the State Department nixed it. Um, although the airfield there 
yes. you mentioned in the book, yep. is this was a really interesting tidbit about how money and power intersect. Yeah. Uh, um, there's no, if there's no tunnel, do you, how you get there? Yeah, so the, uh, there, w if there is no tunnel, um, there, uh, there are the, this fleet of what are known as the cog birds, uh, this flight of uh, three Gulf Stream jets that shadow the President of the United States wherever he goes uh, that are specially configured to land on a runway adjacent to Mount Weather on the farm that used to belong to Bunny Mellon, um, the philanthropist uh, and heiress here in town. Um, that, and one of these planes is always uh, close to the president, sort of at an adjacent airport uh, in case something happens to Air Force One itself. Um, it, it would actually uh, pick up the president and whisk the president to Mount Weather. Sir, and then back. Yes, go ahead. Matt Hendrickson, another Washingtonian friend. Uh, kind of picking up where Harry left off. It sounds like through your research, you've almost been able to get into the minds of the way that the planners laid their plans out. Uh, with that perspective, do you have any kind of hunches or theories about things that are out there now that aren't yet discovered in public and you know if there's not a tunnel what is there um, so a, a there's a whole new set of these facilities um, and, and and some of them we know about and some we don't uh, the the other thing though is you know I assume that there is some modern version of something like that PS3 program uh, that I mentioned that would uh, basically provide for adequate leadership around presidential successors. Um, a, a, and as I said, I sort of hope that there is something like that because like, we don't want uh, you know, some of these more junior cabinet secretaries sort of rudderless after uh, an attack. Um, in the back. And let's take, we're kind of running up against time, but I do want to give everyone a chance to ask a question. So go ahead and then let's come up. Uh, there are a few questions left. Thank you. Uh, John Pond, I'm a federal employer, though not on any of these uh, bunker lists, I, I'm afraid. Um, I'm really curious about um, the government estimates everything, plans for everything. And during the height of the Cold War, I could see how a lot of this would make sense for a more limited attack on Washington and New York. But for the full scale, how many thousands of war uh, warheads? Yeah, did tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Yeah complete destruction of the U.S., what did they actually think they were going to be running besides all the people in the bunkers and the Liberty Bell and the copy of the, the Constitution? So, so part of this is, uh, and, and I was surprised to read these reports, uh, but even under an absolute worst case scenario, you would still have huge chunks of the American population surviving. Um, and, and whether that number ended up being 60 million or 80 million or 100 million, um, you know, who knows? And I don't think we probably actually have a real good grasp of what that ends up being. Um, but at least from the, uh, the initial attack, you would still have tens of millions, uh, you know, perhaps even 100 million Americans survive. Um, Nuclear winter wouldn't be awesome afterwards. Uh, like the fires wouldn't be awesome afterwards. Uh, so there would be a bunch of like second order and third order issues. Um, but you know that's what Ben Carson and Betsy DeVos can sort out uh, down the road. Right. So let's bundle uh, the sort of remaining questions here in the front together and give Gary a chance to make some concluding remarks. Hi, David Priest. Uh, I'm curious. Archival research on sensitive national security topics is hard. Mm -hmm. Getting interviews from people about literally existential topics is hard. You had access to information about sites like, we can presume, at least Camp David, still functioning in some of the purposes that you wrote about. Mm -hmm. You had to consider the ethics of this. You had to consider what can I write about and what crosses a line that I may have heard and may have some ideas on, but it's it, it's still sensitive enough that this could be a vulnerability. 
how did you draw that line and were there things that you decided not to include that, that you found and you thought were, mm -hmm. were decent, but you just decided, no, we don't need to put that out there? Yeah. Um, so one of, so there are sort of two, two, two things that were really helpful in the research of this. One is uh, the government has no idea what it declassifies or what it is keeping classified. And so, uh, you know, in multiple different presidential libraries, you know, I would be going through and you would get to one folder and it would still be classified. And then you get like six folders further on and there'd be that, that exact same file declassified. Um, and so there was a lot more in the public domain than I thought. Um, the second thing is uh, LinkedIn is sort of this amazing modern tool uh, for reporting on sensitive government subjects uh, because in a way that would be like nearly impossible you know, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, you can now find like the people who piloted uh, you know, the presidential doomsday planes in the 80s and 90s. And you can find people who worked at Raven Rock uh, because they listed on their LinkedIn profile. Um, uh, I will not say that I had a particularly high success rate in getting those people to uh, respond to my interview request. Uh, but uh, certainly a lot more luck than I would have had 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and, and then sort of to your, your final question, like, yes, like I, uh, there was all sorts of stuff that I ended up keeping out of the book, um, both, both from a speculative nature um, about the modern plans and then also sort of like the where and when of some of the modern facilities and plans. Um, and, and, and partly that's uh, because I think just there's a level of it that does, do, where there is a good argu argument for continued secrecy. But then also, like, that, you get the gist of all of this through the course of the whole book. Um, and that there were sort of, uh, uh, you know, there were lots of little details here and there that I, that I kept out for sort of one reason or another, and some of them were just based. I think we're about at, at time, so I know there are more questions, but Garrett will stick around yep. sign books for a little bit, so you can you can still ask them. Um, but uh, you know, thanks for a really interesting talk. Yeah, to, to go thanks with for a, having a great me. Great book. And,